throw it back to Gray uh, to get started on send. Yeah, now we come to the portion of the event that I know many of you have been waiting for, <clears throat> sand bedding. When West Coast Robotics is approached by somebody for a design of a system to work with sand bedding, we always go to the firm and see, gather information to see what we have to work with. Typically, we'll return with a detailed drawing and a quote and will appear to be very experienced and wise in manure equipment. And it's obvious that we have the confidence to stand behind the design that we're showing. So how does a sales rep born in 1987 put together a design of, that's on a level with someone who's been selling equipment, manure equipment, since 1987? Well, you're about to find out. At West Coast Robotics, we have a great relationship with Val Metal Group, and they've been an excellent supplier, and they stand behind us every step of the way. Ralph Fanning has been uh, an advisor to us on any time we're dealing with something new or complicated, uh, and he's personally helped me out in many uh, designs to work with sand that have turned out to produce a very happy, uh, a very good system for the customer. I've always been impressed with Ralph's ability to communicate what can be a pretty technical and challenging topic in a way that's enjoyable and easy to digest. So keeping that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to the video and I hope that uh, you all get enjoy getting to see a little bit of, of who we go to when we want to talk to an expert on manure equipment. Hi, I'll introduce myself. My name is Ralph Fanning. I've been with James Way Farm Equipment since 1987, working in feed handling and manure. <clears throat> and uh, West Coast Robotics people asked me to speak a little bit today on the subject of manure systems for sand bedding. So uh, first, a little bit about our company. Uh, it is now a division of Valmetal, and we're rebranding our equipment. Uh, in 2021, as we speak, from the red James Way equipment you're familiar with to orange under the Val Metal brand. And that's because it's a large company in many divisions, with everything from feed storage and, <clears throat> and feed processing is a big part of what we do, feed mixers, feed delivery systems, and in the manure side of things, manure collection and transfer equipment, manure processing, and application equipment. So uh, it's really a complete circle around the cow, as you see there, for all the things uh, related to feed and manure. We also have a division based in California specialized in wastewater treatment and is also, uh, well, on very, on large scale agriculture. Uh, the photo there is a, a water scrubbing system for a pistachio plant, I believe, actually. But we're here today to talk about sand bedding. And sand bedding has uh, some pros and cons, of course. The pros, it's excellent comfort for the animal. You'd like lying on the beach just like she is right now. Uh, and it also uh, produces excellent floor traction in the alleyways just the way sand, the grit that's left on the floor. Uh, there's uh, the argument also that it's an inert bedding. It uh, won't support bacterial growth, which of course is true if you have pure sand. And uh, that's pretty critical uh, to have very, very clean sand. And in all cases, it requires extremely good stall maintenance, no matter whether it's sand or other types of bedding. Uh, if there's leaked milk or uh, manure that's left in the back of the stall, of course, it's going to propagate bacteria, nothing new. But uh, <clears throat> there seems to be sometimes a perception that changing to sand bedding means you can do less stall maintenance, and that's certainly not the case. So what are the problems with sand bedding? Well, one big problem is uh, it's extremely abrasive. It's uh, very bad for equipment. So my old saying, of course, sand bedding is good for the cow and it's good for me as an equipment salesperson. So I hope you're going to be happy too. But really, there's a long way has been, uh, there's been a lot of progress in, in uh, making this less problematic. Uh, we're very familiar with wear parts in, 
in uh, sand bedding in many applications, uh, tillage, excavation, etc. So it requires special construction and it also requires cooperation from the farm. Best practices reduce the amount of sand going into the manure system. We have farms that are using in excess of 80 pounds per cow per day and uh, many that are down at 30 pounds per cow per day. You can be sure the equipment will last much, much longer when there's a lower content of sand, of course. So the little cutaways on the on the right hand side here, you see a conventional curb at the back of a stall that's filled up with sand. And the problem with this is we have a brisket board. We want her hanging over the stall a bit so that manure falls in the alley. The problem is this is not comfortable to her, so she's not going to like that. She'll creep forward into the stall uh, or she'll have a sore, hot, uh, sore uh, hip. So the tendency to protect against that is we fill the stall up much more full. And that gives her a nice comfortable bed like we see here. The problem, of course, with that on bedding day, there is a huge amount of sand that goes out into the alleys. So if the construction is made with a sand curb, which is gently sloped on the inside, and we fill up barely level to it. If her hip lies on this gentle slope, it doesn't bother her. In fact, she's quite shaped that way. So uh, a sand curb will reduce the amount of kick out in the, in the first day an enormous amount. Also, when you're placing sand, if it's placed too much at the back, when you add sand, uh, it needs to be distributed a bit. If you have a hummock back here, they will, they will paw around and put a lot more sand out into the alleyway again. Uh, this is a significant problem that systems that work well uh, several days of the week may fail on sand day, uh, stall filling day sometimes. So our first job in a manure system is to collect up the manure. Of course, there's lots of choices, flush systems or tractor scrape, etc. But uh, the, the use of robots has changed a lot of thinking. And not only is it impossible to drive through with tractors uh, in a barn that's populated all the time, uh, there's a recognition that uh, your time is not free. In fact, it's one of your, it is your most valuable resource. And uh, spending time chasing manure down alleys is, is not a good investment of your time. Uh, and hiring people to do it is extremely difficult today. So automated scrapers are pretty much a norm. They work very well. Uh, they're simple, a reasonably low cost investment, and they have a very low, very low operating cost. So once we've gathered up the manure, what we've received is coming out of the cow at uh, 11, 12% 12 uh, dry matter or solids content and is uh, semi-solid. So we have to decide from here, what are we going to do with this manure, which has sand in it and organics and, and all these things. And we, ha we have a basic choice. We're going to handle it from here on as a semi-solid, or we're going to uh, liquefy it and handle it as a liquid. This in the picture is we call a test disc, a 24 inch circle. You set it up on something, it's on a five gallon pail here. You grab another pail, get a manure sample. You pour it all over the disc and you wait one minute and you let it all drip off as much as it wants. After one minute, you measure at the middle and this is now our slump score, which looks to be three inches on this. So that's a semi-solid manure. When you're in a manure that will go through a vertical electric pump, the score would be one half inch to three quarter inch typically. So to separate the sand out of the manure, now we need the opposite. We need to be working with water. Uh, we want to separate the sand and the manure. So we can choose to collect this as a semi-solid and liquefy it here, but in most cases we're going to liquefy it in the cross gutter. And then we will take the sand out and send the rest off to storage. So the collection system most typically is called a flume, uh, an underfloor pipe or trench. Trenches are better in sand, by the way. If you ever had a problem, you have access to clean out a problem. 
Uh, but we uh, drop manure into this pipe by the alley scraper system and a pump brings liquid and shoots it down the line and flushes like a toilet. And we bring this all back to a reception pit. Uh, from there, uh, we can decide what we're going to do, send it to storage or separate sand. And there's some rules about cleaning this out. We're going to need a lot of flow. And the amount of flow will depend on the type of sand you have, the width of the barn, uh, and uh, the water content. But pretty typical, a round flume like this is around 40 horsepower. Uh, if you're really horsepower challenged, you can build a much more expensive flume pipe, uh, a V-trench. Uh, it's very difficult to build, but it will work with lower flow rates. So be prepared, you're going to need large motors for flume systems. Most typically, depending on elevations, we'll either have to collect that into a reception pit and then elevate it, or preferably we could come straight out of the barn into something called a sand lane. And a sand lane is a, uh, <coughs> well, it's exactly that, it's a laneway that has a very specific uh, slope. And our job here is to slow down the flow. And we wanna slow it down specifically to the speed at which all the sand will start falling out of the water, but the organics will not. And this is very important. If we are too slow in the lane, we don't have enough flow, we don't have the right slope, we don't have the right consistency of manure, the organics will stick in the sand and that's not good. We want clean sand. So velocity is everything. That has to do with design and matching pumps and also to do with the, uh, the amount of water. And that, that requires some management that we don't have time to go into, but we're going to recirculate the same water multiple times and we're going to need to refresh it from one source or another. Of course, we use milk house water. Maybe that's enough in some cases, but usually we need to get, get some other refresh water into the system. In any case, this is the whole principle. It's a quarter percent slope and we we set up the width to agree with your flow rates and your tractor bucket by the way and then the length will depend on how much sand we want to accumulate we need a certain amount of length in order for sand to really slow down and and drop out but then on this operation is a large operation in california they clean the sand out uh, once a day or twice a day in fact they will have two of these sand lanes they will clean each one once a day. So they have about 12 hours capacity in a 300 foot lane. Well, uh, where where you are, that's too big of a lane and, no, and we don't wanna probably clean it out every day. So this might be something more typical. I know uh, West Coast has installed a number of sand lanes already, but this is a, a, a more um, reasonable scale operation the liquid from the flume comes in here and it's going across not down the alley so that it, it it stops there's usually a deceleration pot here to slow it immediately so that as we begin flowing down the alley we're already slow and you see there's a lot of sand accumulated right here and as we go down then we see the liquid so what happens if i don't clean this out right now the liquid level is a high thin layer and it speeds across this and continues dropping sand down in the open area. So it fills progressively from one end to the other. And basically, if you have a sand lane that shows sand two thirds of the way down, it's time to clean it out because there's already some sand sneaking over the end. And if you think you can get it 90% full before you clean it out, this is where systems get in trouble. You're putting sand downstream now in places that weren't supposed to have sand. So proper use of a sand lane is super important. This guy has a depression down here. He will occasionally clean this out. There shouldn't be sand in this lane, but it's, it's sized for his skid steer bucket I see. And he's got a crash bar there so that the skid steer driver can't get to the edge of the uh, reception pit, which is a pretty good idea, I believe. So in these systems, we're going to use an impeller pump. We added a lot of water to get the slump down below a half, uh, half inch. 
And so what pump do we need? So this, this is actually a more complex question in sand than in non-sand. Just understand there's a lot of variables in making a pump performance. The impeller diameter, the RPM, the tip speed, uh, all, all these things are crucial. Tip speed is what develops pressure in a system, which is great if you need pressure. Here we're really chasing volume. We will want large paddles. We'll want efficient style of paddle. And one thing to consider is we're going to want a large diameter inlet on the uh, impeller and large paddles because we are not working with water. We're working with dairy manure. And uh, as you all know, you will have all kinds of foreign objects in there. You may have a placenta, you may have uh, a hoof block, you may have who knows what. But it's uh, <clears throat> working with very small pumps doesn't work. We offer submersible pumps, we offer small diameter pumps. These are great in liquids, uh, really high, high speed impellers. They can pump a lot of gallons with a relatively small unit, but they can't take any kind of debris. So we want to focus on, on a larger impeller diameter and a largish inlet. This chart down here is just interesting to me because it's showing all the pump performances and this is all on the same pump. All I've done is trimmed the paddle slightly. It's a quarter inch trim on each uh, diameter, one eighth of an inch off each paddle. And what it's telling me, there's a high pressure pump from a different from our uh, wastewater division at 100 feet of head pressure. I could be pumping uh, around a thousand gallons per minute and I'd be using around uh, 55 horsepower. If I trimmed that back, uh, four eighths, half an inch, I would be delivering around 500, 600 GPM at 40 horsepower. So very small changes make very big differences on these pumps. And we need to make sure the pump you choose is going to match your flow requirements in your flume and your sand lane. If we're using the same pump for transfer to storage, then we have to also worry about distance and pressure. There's one other thing to look at. The housing design, there's a couple choices. This is called a volute. You see that the clearance increases and increases away from the housing uh, on the as compared to a round housing. This we offer, this is great in thick manure, but this one is more efficient in water-like manure. This is the performance curve for the volute and this for the round housing. So we're going to get twice as much flow for the same horsepower by targeting the right impeller design. So selecting a pump for sand, we have to worry about the construction features, uh, the, the use of special steel, how easy to service, how expensive to keep up, and of course, the bottom bearing has not a very fun life in sand. So all of our pumps, uh, either standard, our 16 inch pump is standard, our other pumps, it's optional. You can have standard steel or hard ox 450 construction. So what is hard ox 450? You hear AR steel or abrasion resistant steel. Well, there's many grades of AR steel. We use AR200 and we use Hardox 450. Hardox 450 is at the limit of what can be bent or curved. Any harder than that, it's approaching tool steel. It will crack. It's extremely difficult to work with. We, we can't drill a hole. Everything must be plasma or laser. Uh, so that's where we stop. If we have to machine it or do other things, we'll use a thicker grade of AR200. But the pump impellers are all made of Hardox 450. As you can see from the chart, the wearability of Hardox 450 is very, very, very high compared to Hardox 400, which is very high compared to 200 and very high compared, of course, to mild steel. So this is as good as you can get in in uh, uh, something that has to be formed or welded. The perimeter of anything we build in Hardox has these indicator notches. 
because once they're painted, they look the same. The hard ox steel is very different when it's not painted, but once they're painted, they all look alike. You can indicate, you can tell by the uh, indications that are in every hard ox part. Ease of service is important. If you're outdoors and you have a telehandler or something around, you can pluck a pump right out of the pit, no problem. If you're indoors, these are no longer an option. We have different levels of kits for removing your pumps. Uh, West Coast Robotics people can tell you about that, but uh, it's an important consideration. You will get something jammed in your pump one day and you need it out so you can get running. You can easily lift and service a pump yourself. Uh, or if you have a major service job, the serviceman will spend much less billable hours getting your pump in and out of the pit. So a lift kit is an investment, but you will get paid back and it's safe. All of our pumps are bolted modular construction. The inlet plate will wear much sooner than the housing, so it's bolt on. The housing will wear much sooner than the elbow, so it's bolt on. The elbow, by the way, is is a, a heavy weld elbow, so it's a very, very thick steel. It's a, a, cat, a cast or an extruded part, so it's about a half inch thick of hard steel. The oil bath is a module. This is the bearing area. It's going to need service. Are you going to be down for a week? Or are you going to be down for an hour? It's a module that pops in and out, so you can put your pump back in service and repair the other spare later. Speaking of the bottom bearing, uh, we have two versions. This is for a 16 inch pump and it uses a similar system as this is for the 20 inch electric pump. This is impeller diameters we talk about. There is a stack of seals at each end. At the upper end, uh, we just have a couple of seals. At the bottom end here, we have six of them. One is a double lip to keep the oil in. Two of them are, are grease seals that are preventing dirt from approaching the oil seal. And these ones are grease seals that are allowing grease pressure to vent outwards. So we're always flushing the outside. And that's the principle of any good bottom bearing in manure. You need to flush the grease through the seals to prevent entry. And uh, this happens to be a very large high horsepower. It's a 250 horsepower unit uh, that we put on uh, the uh, large electric pumps. And the one, the smaller version you saw earlier is a five seal. This one is an eight seal. And these have been in use for many, many years. Other thing to consider is the duty cycle. We might have three or four different models of pumps that could supply your needs but some are small pumps running fast and some are large pumps running slow well uh, a big strong pump running slow is good a high capacity pump running few hours of course is good just so you know uh, velocity is not our friend in sand uh, so we will require a certain tip speed in order to uh, produce the pressure we need but flushing is not a high pressure job we're better off with a low tip speed and a big paddle to produce the volume we need, and you'll have a lot less wear. A quick bit of info on the two series of pumps, the 12 and 16 inch are the same pump, only the impeller housing and blade are a different size. And these both feature a five by five main beam with a two and three quarter inch balance drive line. So it's a tubular drive line, pulley on the top and oil bath on the bottom. Very simple, no mid bearings. Uh, it's a six inch discharge impeller, six inch discharge pipe full length. And uh, in the 12 inches available 10 to 40 horsepower versions or 20 to 40 for the 16 inch. The impeller is the same in all case. It's only the pulley ratios that change. A small change in speed makes a vast change in flow and horsepower. Uh, we would never consider 12 inch in raw dairy manure. For a separated liquid, it's a fine choice. 16 inch is the smallest impeller I would recommend in dairy manure to have the capacity for 
some amount of uh, a decent amount of debris to pass. Not have constant blocking. The other choice in uh, high volume systems is the 20 inch impeller and we've stepped up everything here. This is a heavy, heavy pump. It's an eight by eight inch main beam, a four inch by 300 horsepower drive line, uh, <laughs> same as is used in PDO equipment of ours. It's an eight inch discharge on the impeller, so it's an eight inch weld elbow and discharge pipe all the way to the top. And it's offered in 50 and 75 horses standard. There is a 100 horse, which uh, requires a some discussions about how you're going to bring it in and out for service because of the weight of the motor. But uh, this is the industrial version pump. And uh, I, I know uh, West Coast Robotics has sold both versions, so you can speak to them if you want to go see one or the other. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, working with sand laden manure, the things, the system needs to be the right design from the start. And then with the proper equipment selection uh, and, and construction, you're going to have a satisfactory life. Uh, we, we don't want to overwork equipment or put inappropriate equipment into sand. Uh, you'll be a very unhappy owner. So I hope our experience is a little bit of help for you. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Goodbye. All right. Thanks, Ralph. Um, great, great presentation. Uh, me and uh, Gray were sure glad to uh, model our guns for that picture. Um, I'll let you guys uh, guess which one was which. Um, so uh, Ralph shared a, a, a lot of great information, very detailed, and uh, it's only half of a, a longer presentation, which you can find the link uh, below that live stream here. So um, if you're if you're keen on finding uh, more information about sand uh, sand manure management definitely click the link below after our our presentation here and uh, have a look at Ralph's uh, full presentation um, some of the information we're sharing here may not be suitable to all other areas due to the benefits of ben uh, of BC's climate um, so here uh, uh, talking about sand I'll cover again more of the cow side of bedding rather than the material side of it um, Here's a, here's a table showing uh, data from 205 cows and 16 different freestall facilities uh, on sand bedding. Uh, it shows that, uh, that cows on sand bedding lie down for 20 minutes longer for each lying bout, so 1.3 hours versus one hour on, uh, on mattresses, and take fewer bouts per day. Uh, that results, uh, uh, so 10 versus 14, then cows on mattresses. Um, <clears throat> resting behavior of uh, the 205 cows on that study show that you know it results in 12.7 hours of lying time on sand versus 11.5 on mats. Um, so, uh, so I think we can achieve uh, the the same results on both types of bedding, but it's interesting to to see the, those kinds of studies. Uh, new, new, newer mattresses uh, products uh, util utilize foam uh, like the Huber mats, uh, water like the DCC waterbed or gel to provide improved cushion over the older mat and rubber crumb filled products. Uh, in a preference studies uh, performed by Roger Palmer at the University of Arlington in 2003 uh, showed that cows prefer to lie in sand stalls and, and on the more cushioned mattress. Um, I'd like to point out here again uh, that uh, that this is from 2003, so the mattresses technology and comfort has in, improved greatly uh, since then. As you can see on the table here, that's uh, uh, the waterbed, the old waterbed single chamber. So uh, I would definitely uh, see them go up in the in in that table. Um, so updated studies would need to be done. Uh, something that maybe is more like within the last five years. Um, but on the table, again, if we can bring that up, 69% uh, uh, of the cows chose sand. Um, I believe uh, we have to be careful when we're looking at uh, studies like this because uh, there's also an adaptation period. Uh, given a choice, the cows will obviously choose more stable surface to lie in, um, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean she won't lay down as much uh, once she's familiar with the new surface uh, and be just as comfortable. Um, uh, again, another table here the, from the University of Wisconsin uh, survey uh, 60 high producing freestall dairy herds in Wisconsin, uh, the 
showed that the prevalence of uh, swollen hocks in matches herds was 29% versus compared to 5% in do deep loose bedded herds. Um, deep loose bedding provides more cushion around bony areas and is associated with fewer lame cows, which in turn reduces the risk of, uh, for a severe hawk and knee injury. Um, uh, poorly managed in design, uh, like I, I want to point out that poorly managed uh, in design deep bedded stalls, though, are associated with an increased risk uh, for medial hawk injuries caused by uh, the limb hanging, uh, the, the, the back legs hanging over the raised rear curb when cow lies uh, diagonally across the stall and when land uh, sand fill is poor in uh, those, those deep bedded stalls. Um, stall sizing is critical in all types of bedding uh, and the Dairyland Initiative's website has great resources if you want to verify your stall. Uh, that's another link that's below the live stream here. It has sizing all based on weight of cows, so great resource to look through. Uh, so before you invest in a, a, a new type of bedding, if you're going to keep the stall base that you have, it's good to go and measure and see if maybe you can make some improvement there uh, before you put in that new type of bedding. I'd like to show a video here uh, just of an example of how management and stall sizing is, is crucial in any type of bedding uh, because that's going to that's gonna determine the success of uh, your, your chosen bedding type. Um, here's a video of a cow uh, trying to lie down into a bedded, deep bedded stall so you can see she's hitting her uh, neck on the neck rail and she's not too comfortable on her, her right uh, rear leg. She's taken some time to place herself properly, lunge a bit forward, and and finally lie down. Uh, which is, you know, we'd like to see the cows uh, lie down and get up with more confidence. Um, so again, here there's there's critical uh, points there. I think you could see that the 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 bedding was a little bit low. The hoof health maybe needed to be addressed on that cow, and the stall size, the neck rail. Uh, needed to be addressed as well. So key points to look at when you're when you're choosing any types of bedding um, I wanted to point out and uh, uh, with that uh, um, I, I want to show another table here sand the sand benefits uh, again That's a table coming from the Dairyland. <coughs> sorry initiative uh, but it shows that uh, on average uh, comparing sand sand versus uh, uh, mattresses I uh, showed that uh, uh, on a rolling herd average, an ex extra 1,100 uh, kgs of milk, seven kgs of corrected uh, energy corrected milk, uh, uh, lowers SEC by 13,000 uh, in a 2% reduction in turnover rate. So, uh, so great benefits that we see from uh, sand, sand bedding. Um, with that, I'd like to show a, a preview of a, 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 little, sh a little video of uh, Halmer uh, Farms, uh, Adri and Monique uh, Stoit. Um, they've been on sand bedding for a while, and I'd like to point your attention also at the end of the video, you will see a cow uh, standing up, and I'd like you to pay attention to how confident she is when she's standing up. Welcome to uh, Hollemare Farms. Uh, my name is Edith Stout, this is my daughter Monique. And I farm with Monique and my son and his girlfriend uh, Andrew and Esther. Uh, we are here in beautiful Legacy. And uh, you guys want to ask me about uh, why I have sand bedding and sand lane and stuff. I, uh, I, before I built this barn in 90, oh no, 2019 now, it's a couple of years ago already. I had uh, bed, uh, cow mattresses and I put a little bit of sawdust over top of that. Uh, the reason I did this, went with sand this time, I heard good things about it. Uh, there is no organic matter growing into, in sand and uh, that's one of the main reasons. And the cows are comfortable with it because they can lay however they want to or whatever. That's the main thing and like yeah, of course there is no organic matter growing in it. Uh, less the chance of mastitis is supposed to be less, especially in the summertime, that's the main thing. Since when we started, it's over a year ago now, uh, we, have, we ordered one or two loads of sand, and that is more because in the beginning it packs more. We ordered another load after a month, and after that, about seven months, yeah, about four or five months ago, we ordered another load, and after that, we haven't ordered a load yet, so, but 
uh, the reclamation is pretty good. Uh, I just the cleaning uh, we're just trying to figure out a little bit yet, but I hopefully we got to figure out after uh, after a month or whatever. Other than that, we're putting in sand just about every every week. We put a little bit in there again, and uh, uh, that's going really good. And and one of the reasons too, I still have to order sawdust for the heifer bar and all the stuff. It's about twelve hundred dollars a load, and it's about every month, right? So you, I'm saving about twelve hundred dollars for the cows. Would have been the same or more. Uh, you know, I save about twelve hundred to fifteen hundred dollars a month on sawdust. I know I can have more cost rebuilding stuff, uh, pumps, because sand wears out more. But I mean, I think it's still uh, the the cost is going to be lower, and and especially for for mastitis wise too, right? In the other barn, we always had. One, once every month we had, a, we had a cow with the splits uh, and over here actually the cows got out and one did the splits because she was in the, in the feeding alley where we got her up, put her back in the sawdust pack and two days later she was back in the herd because it's like Monique said, that it's the, it's their first way sturdier on their, uh, on their feed, right? And same with heat, you see the heat's better. Not that we don't have to see them because they will show up on the computer but I mean you see more activity with the cows that way. Other than that, they are really quiet.